one of those unusual questions because I had to <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Yeah, I'm Master Greg. I've had people ask me those questions. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about that. You know, I started, uh, I get a little background on me. So I started growing orchids when I was 18 years old. Uh, orchid kid nerds. And, uh, you know, it's the neighbor lady, right? All of us have had neighbor ladies in our lives. And a lot of ladies had a neighbor kid in their lives. And uh, so my neighbor lady, Mrs. Medina, recruited me to help her repot her orchids. And she had cat a big, big tubs. Couldn't pick them up. They were so big and heavy. And so uh, I'd get over there and help her repot. You know, that, after that first time helping her, I remember uh, very clearly how it played out. I don't remember any money changing hands, so I must have worked cheap. <laughs> but I do remember a big stack of orchid magazines. Remember the old-fashioned ones, the little square little yeah. ones? Yeah. And so she gave me a big stack of those. And in one of those was an advertisement for the San Diego Orchid Society show. And so I hopped in my light blue Ford Pinto station wagon. Right? Remember those? Not a hatchback. It was just so it wasn't going to explode if I got crazy. But the station wagon. I drove down to that show and I bought a bunch of orchids. I brought cat ladies. That was the king of the day. And uh, so I had two armloads and come in the front door and, you know, just a little home. Mom, mom, look at this. You know, I'm going to. Orchids are so beautiful, and I love growing orchids. And she looked at me and she said, How much did you spend on those? <laughs> this is my supportive mother who, up until that moment in my life, had done everything to encourage my <laughs> everything I was interested in. And I said, Well, I, I spent $300. And then she said, $300? You know, that's your life savings. So I wasn't. Shock, and I think I said something like, well, Look at these, I'm gonna love growing these, you know. And then she said something like, When those go out of flower, you're gonna wish you never spent the money. And I'm pretty sure I was a dumb 18 year old, and I said something like, I'm 18 years old, and I know exactly what I'm gonna be doing the rest of my life. And of course, my infinitely wise mother let me have the last word. So I work in construction. And so when you work in construction, you have access to job site spoils. Right? So I got some boards and some windows. The next thing you know, I had a lean-to greenhouse built up against a house that's 20 feet long and 8 feet wide. Got all my orchids moved in there, and they look great. They're all in flower. It only took about two weeks to put up. Had all my plants, they look great. A month goes by, I'm down to just a couple plants in flower. Another month goes by, I just down to the bitter end. Another month and they're all green. And my mother's words are you know, echoing back there. And then another month go by and I'm hanging tough. Another month and I'm sitting on the couch with my dad. And, dad, yeah, I think I'm losing interest. And he looks at me and gave me the best advice. He said, don't tell your mother that. So I did, and he introduced me to a colleague of his, this guy, and he had an orchid nursery. And I was in construction at the time, so I could help do repairs, and he used to make orchid hybrids. So I could, he let me use his lab. Of course, I was broke now, and so I could make the first hybrids I made when I was 19, 19 years old or so. And uh, that's 42 years ago. So it's been good. So these Catleas were really a defining part of my, of my orchid, and it's still it's the largest part of my nursery are Catleas. But about maybe 20 years, 22, three years ago, I realized that I really wanted to distinguish my collection. You know, if you're doing something like, like an artist, because breeding plants is a lot like art, you know. And so I really wanted to create and do something that had never been done before. I wanted to have something unique. And so I learned about Catacetina, so I started buying the plants and breeding them. The next thing you know, I had some huge successes. And that was, that was a great thing. And so this talk is about catacetums. Now the group catacetum is there Cygnoches and there's Mormonis and Boletias. We're just going to talk about catacetums here. It's a, it's a broad group. And this stays focused on mostly what I brought to, mostly catacetums and their close relatives, clovacetums. So catacetums, easily pronounced. As it says, 
set at a C tone. Easy enough. Some of them are a lot harder to pronounce, trust me. Cata from the Greek means downward, and seta from the Latin means bristle. Even if you speak Spanish, seta sounds a lot like a bristle, like a stero, like a stero, right? And so it's the and so catacetums are called the downward hair orchid or the downward bristle orchid because on the male flower there's a two hairs that hang down that are very distinctive in orchids. Catacetums are a member of the Cymbidiini tribe. They're related to Cymbidiums. And this is interesting when you think about it, because Cymbidiums come from the old world. Indochina, Northern Australia, India, places like this, and catacetums come from the New World, from the Americas. And if you've ever traveled between here and there, you realize that 15 hours flying at 600 miles an hour is, is, is the distance to get you from here to there. It's a long way. And so how the heck did they ever jump over the, the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean uh, to get onto the New World? It's pretty amazing. <coughs> I think orchids are a lot older than we give them credit for. Probably going on about a hundred million years old on this planet. Catacetum and I have been in cultivation since the early 1800s, so this predates a lot of the big orchids that we recognize and grow today. Catacetums were some of the first plants those earlier, early sailors found when they arrived in the New World. They would sail up these estuaries and rivers because their boats are covered with barnacles, not a great thing. You get into some fresh water, the fresh water kills the barnacles and they're easier to clean up. And in these estuaries where they were doing this, kind of seeds that were growing. And they make excellent hobby plants. Kind of seeds, they're just the easiest and best thing. And so, kind of seeds, they have a huge distribution. In fact, they grow from central Mexico all the way down to Argentina. This is a huge range. It's a, there aren't other orchids that have such a range as catacetums. And this is a, a, a unique, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. They prefer environmental conditions that have their open areas with lots of light, lots of air movement. They live where it's hot and humid and wet in the summer and cool and dry in the winter. This is the conditions that they've evolved, evolved under for uh, millennia. And so they look like places like this. Now, when I was driving here, I saw places that looked like this <laughs> on the way here. And so you're already, it looks to me like you guys got good conditions. And so they really like growing on palm trees. And palm tree has everything the catacetum needs. And when you, you look at those palm trees back in that view and you get up close to them, you hop the fence and you look up for the cows and you get over there, that's what you see on those trees. Do you know where that picture was taken? Uh, Venezuela. Uh, and so, there's some interesting things, you know, if you really love orchids, and you really like growing orchids, one, and uh, you have a special uh, species or type that you like, going to see your plants in the wild, your favorite plants in the wild, is profound. It will deeply change how you feel about growing those plants, and you'll have this, this tremendous, you know, growth in your awareness, and so, uh, the, this isn't my first trip to see catacetum, but it was an important trip. These kind of, look where they're growing on those trees. Yeah, uh, pretty low here, yeah. It was pretty hot and humid in the summer. So they're growing, so they're growing on a palm tree. So what's life like on a palm tree? They get direct light in the morning, that low angle light's coming in. In midday, they have an umbrella of leaves overhead, and then in the afternoon, they have direct light again. That's a fairly bright conditions. There's lots of air movement there. And you see where they favor on the tree, right where the leaf joins the tree. And if you've ever, uh, you know, studied palm trees, you'll, you notice how the leaves grow and the way they're shaped. And the leaf is pleated, and then the stem that the leaf attached to is pleated, and then it connects to the trunk. So palm trees need nutrients and water, just like orchids do. So the palm tree has evolved a shape to help catch the dust, debris, and moisture that falls on the leaves, it ducks it down the leaves to the stem, to the trunk, and then it runs down and delivers water and nutrients to the base of the palm tree. That's a good strategy if you want to survive. And so the catacetums have learned, I guess that plants can learn, but have discovered, or whatever they do, have optimized 
that point where the leaf joins the trunk. Have you ever shucked a palm tree? How dirty of top is that? <laughs> you really don't think of palm trees as being too dirty until you go clean off that stuff and it's a just, it'll stain your clothes, right? You can't even wash it out. And so at that point where the leaf connects to the trunk, organic matter collects there. If there's any bird droppings or dust, which there's quite a bit of, the, a little bit of rain washes it down to that joint. So at that joint is a nutrient rich location. And that's where the catechetums are. They like lots of nutrients and lots of water. The tree catches the water and it delivers right where they need it. So there's stuff that looks like moss in there? It's not moss, it's big. There's actually stuff mosses growing here, yeah. Oh, see it? Mosses yeah, yeah. Right here you can see the mosses, yeah. This is a bit down the tree though, see here? This isn't right at the crown. It's way below the top of the tree. It's just it's right on there. So it's fascinating to see this, you know? So it, it helps. It's very telling. It tells you what they need in okay. nature. Have yeah. you ever tried to melt one on a palm tree? No, I can't do it in San Diego because it's too oh. cold in the winter. Oh, yeah. we could maybe do it. You might be able to get by with it here. Maybe That's right. Mm. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> if it's getting below about 40, you're wow. gonna, it's going to be challenging. But if you, if you stay above 40, you might be all right. Yeah. So. So here is um, underneath some large plants up there. See these, uh, look at these youngsters sprouting. And look where they're growing, right at that point. Here's a piece of rotted leaf and it's growing there and there. So under these big plants, you often see swarms of seedlings germinating. And uh, I forget about this. So when, you, uh, when you're collecting orchids, I, am I doing a good impersonation of Crocodile Dundee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and so, really, yeah. 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 same thing. My hat, look at my hat. Look at my hat there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, this picture is in Venezuela, and it's really to show you a bit what the back country looks like. See how dry it is? And these acacia like trees, they've dropped all their leaves. And so I learned, I didn't, hadn't really noticed this before about cavitations, but they live in semi-deciduous forests. Well, that makes sense. It's all rainy in the summer, plants leaf out and grow, and in the winter it's dry, so the plants respond by dropping their leaves. And uh, so here I am, and this looks like a smile, right? It appears as though I'm smiling. Uh, have you ever grimaced before in your life? <laughs> That's actually what that is, is a grimace. And you notice the unnatural presentation of my hand here? This is because they grow in a semi-deciduous forest. And there is a plant life called cactus that do well in semi-deciduous forest. And so I was uh, collecting these plants and on the way up the hill, you know, gravity's not so friendly when you're going uphill, you know, you kind of got to work at it. Coming downhill, gravity has a way of caressing you and it kind of brings you along. And so going downhill, I got going pretty fast and I realized I needed to stop put my hand in a cactus. And so you can see the blood is all over me. I did crop the picture for your benefit. Because it looks pretty bad below that point. <laughs> my thumb, just right through my thumb. Right all the way through. Yeah. So what does it take if you're out there, if you're collecting such, are you assuming then bring them back? To Highly the illegal. Yeah. Highly illegal. And so, uh, what you have to do, you can't bring them back to the United States. That would be a federal offense and prison of $50,000 fine minimum. So what happens is, according to the regulations, there's these regulations called CITES, the Convention of International Trade on Endangered Species. So the plants need to be turned over to a certified nursery in the country of origin. They need to be grown uh, under uh, controlled uh, conditions, managed by man, divided, potted in a pot, water with a hose, chemical fertilizer, and after one year of doing this, the plants then become, are legitimatized as nursery grown. And then after that year, you can request and they'll ship them to you with all the proper paperwork and so forth. And that's what happened. Yeah. All right, so, oh, <laughs> so here's my kids. A few years ago, I, I had both of them in my taco about two months ago. They like going to the orchid park because there's nice ladies who have goodies and a lot of orchid plates, cookies and all kinds of good stuff. You know? And so, they, you know, they got nothing to do. They're like, come on, Dad, let us. And so I showed this picture. They were there for this talk. And afterwards, they gave me that 
Dad, don't show anybody that picture. We're so young. It was only like five years ago, right? But when you're 13, five years later, you're now 18. And so I'm very concerned about that. So this is the blue to the size of his hand. Yeah, so this is William. This is Kevin. And you can see Kevin then. He knows what a good cat of Cena looks like. Yeah. Are they interested in No. <laughs> I, I think this guy might be. This guy might. Uh, we'll see. All right. So palm trees is a favorite thing. And you can see, if you look carefully at this palm tree, look at all the, every node has a plant. One, two, three, four, five, six plants. And I think there's even more on the other side. So every one of those points is in, it's just the perfect spot for orchid seed to germinate and the plants to grow. Now, what this really tells me is if you can supply the minimum requirements, you're going to be able to grow these plants. But what about this? Oh. <laughs> okay. Wow. So what are telephone poles treated with to prevent decay? Creosote. Would you have creosote in your potting media to grow your course not? So obviously, the person who treated this pole with creosote was a slacker and they didn't treat the top of the pole very good. Oh. And then maybe it was up there and it got more weathered because it's at the top of it in the wind and the rain and so forth. But there's a cat of seed and it's doing well, right? Is that full, yeah, that is full sun. There's no, not a lot of nutrients on the side of a telephone pole. You know it's well drained. And you can see all the old flower spikes. Look at them all. Yeah. Now you know what a weed is, right? Oh, you're a good master gardener. A weed's a plant out of place. Yeah. And there's some guy who looks at that pole and he's cussing that plant out up there <laughs> because there's dang weeds growing on this telephone pole and he's gonna have to climb up there and get it off eventually. Or what about this? <laughs> now, you know, orchid plants don't have nervous systems, right? That's a human, that's a human thing. But I'll tell you, you know, this plant obviously is not nervous about where it's uh, sitting, right? But I'll tell you, if I was sleeping in this house, I'd be real nervous. <laughs> that's 220 circuit. That's 220, look at three wires, no ground wire. That is one hot circuit. So, but again, what this goes to show you is all you have to do is meet the minimum requirements for the plants and you can grow them. And so what happens in nature, like on that telephone pole and on the palm tree and on the side of the house, the natural cycles of mother nature, the seasonal cycles are what allow these plants to grow good. So later in the talk, we're gonna talk about the seasonal cycles. And if you can understand that and apply it to your growing, you're gonna grow plants just as good as you see here. All right, so catechisms are widely a variable. The flower shape, color, and form. There's over 130 different species. It's fascinating. If all you grew was catacetums, you'd have a huge collection of all these different species that were quite variable. They have pollen ejecting triggers. That downward hair is actually a trigger that sh allows the pollinia to shoot from the flower on the male flowers. Their male, the catacetums have male and female flowers. This is very unusual. They are sexually dimorphic. It, and we know what sexual dimorphism is. Have you ever seen a peacock, a male bird, when he puts a feather, you never forget it, right? That's, a, I've met, that's such a memorable sight. But you ever remember a, a peahen? There gotta be, there has to be peahens, right? But the peacock is the one, and you see it in fishes, very common, the male fishes are always very colorful. They don't live very long, but they're very colorful. Um, you see it in lions, like the male lion, the big mane, very showy, the female lions are more. Uh, yeah, it's a male. Yeah. Well, you think that's all they are. That's right. That's weird. Yeah. But I thought the column was the one of the defining characteristics of an orchid, having that huge column with the male and female. It's it the, is. Except catacetums yeah. and cycnoches have reached a higher state of being over other orchids. They've evolved to this the state. And so, why would you be male and female? So if we're jumping ahead a little bit in the talk, but it's an excellent question. So what's the advantage of being male or female in a population, right? All other orchids are perfect flowers. 
So if you can be, if you hit, can evolve to, as, to a state where you're male or female, you can't self-pollinate. If you can self, and the orchids have strategies to avoid self-pollinization, but if you self-pollinate yourself, you're consolidating your gene expression. And so the offspring, right, are, have a consolidated genes. And so if, if when they sprout and grow, they don't, they, there isn't an opportunity for one to grow, or the chance of one to grow outside of its environment is low. If you can only be outcrossed and a stranger bring pollen in, then the offspring has a higher opportunity to produce plants that are more resistant to or, or capable of dealing with different environmental conditions. And as a result, can th uh, produce offspring that do better. And that might explain why catacetas are so widely distributed. It's a strategy to avoid self-pollinization. And if you avoid self-pollinization, you can have greater gene expression and deal with changing environmental conditions better. Individuals will be born that will be more tolerant of the change. Yeah. They're the easiest to grow, and they can bloom a lot. You can grow them well, and they make excellent hobby plants. And so catacetums. Heliodon is the largest and showiest of the catacetum. Uh, uh, Heliodon, these flowers are quite big. They're about four inches. Heliodon, actually from the Latin, means bonnet shape. And if you look at it, they kind of look like a bonnet. Here's like the brim here, and then the, the front of the bonnet. Heliodon comes in an albino form. And this is Carlos. Pure white flowers. And so to give you a sense of scale, right? So here's Carlos's nose, here's his belly button. That was his reflector. That worker in. So that's about that far, right? Huge flowers cascading up. Just beautiful. On the uh, previous picture that you had there, it's got those two hairs. Is that a male in there? Yeah, these are males. See the trigger here? And then one crosses all under in the case of this uh, uh, subspecies types. Cross up. Some have two that hang down. It just depends. So there is Peleodon Snow White. Look at this one. So here's my model's hand. This flower is variety dinner plate. From here to right there is five inches. Humongous flower. And you can still hold your hand up. Do they have a, a characteristic, you know, like Rima stylus, they all have that weird... They all have a slightly different fragrance. It's, uh, yeah, so Peleodon. Then there's a red color form of Peleodon. The imperial form. That See the is, trigger? You have one uh, similar, yeah. That's fantastic. Look at the arrangement on this. See, there's two flower spikes, one here and one here. But look at the arrangement. See it coming across right there mm -hmm. and right here? Now I want you to blink and look again. See the arrangement going the other way? It's a perfect double helix on two separate inflorescences. So well arranged. I use this picture for AOS judges. See it coming across here and here. And if you look again, there it is going that way. Two different spikes. Two different spikes. Unbelievably well arranged. Then there's Catacetum expansum. It's named for its broad expanded lip. Here you can really see that trigger. See it right there? And here's the other one. It crosses over. Expansive comes in different color forms. There's these green color forms. It's avocado kind of green. When I first got this awarded, the, I purchased this plant from a guy in Japan. And so I'm like, what a cool name, Midori. Like that Japanese liqueur, you know, it's really green. This yeah. is so, I'm gonna just call this expansive. Yeah. Yeah. Midori, right? That's what a great name. It gets an award and everything, and I'm feeling really good about the name. And so I was at a talk, and a Japanese kid in the back of the room raised his hand. What Midori means? I'm like, yeah, it's a really cool liqueur. And he goes, well, it, what it really means is green. <laughs> and so, what this is, so I really think it's a great name, and it's just kind of expansive green. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> then there's Tenebrosum. 
dark and shadowy, but it has a contrasting lip. So I want you to think about this. So there's 130 different species. We saw Puliata, we saw Expansum, we've seen Tenebrosa. So keep an eye on how the flowers vary. So here is Spitzia. Really beautiful. So you guys have those little Argentine ants here? Yeah. Yeah, look, there's one right there. So look at the size of the stem. You know how big those are. That stem's as big as a thumb. And there's about 40 flowers on this spray. See the male and female flowers are different? Yeah, these are all males. These are all males. Yeah. See the triggers? Here the two triggers are side by side. Here's the spitzii in a yellow form. Here you can see the trigger better. And then here's the spitzii with this kind of amber color. That's beautiful. Really a great color. Bees? 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 Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> then there's Spinacium, the wine colored catacetum. Think about the variety again. 135 different species. Here's Saccatum. I brought some of these. Saccatum is really unique. The, so if, if you could see this in person, from up here, the plant's up here somewhere, just above this, and it ends flowering, you know, whoops, below here. Okay. It ends flowering way down here. The spike is four feet long on this plant. And see the long spiral of flowers? See how it wraps around? Right, you can see it, another spiral here. And it also has that double helix. Just fascinating to have such a huge spike. It's called saccatum because it has a saccate lip. And there's a pocket right here for a sac. And that sac somehow is attracted to the pollinators. How long would it take for that only to grow that big? Not very long. Year, two years? Yeah, yeah. They grow quite fast. So here's one called Osculatum. And Osculatum, I was at that same talk where that kid, that Japanese kid raised his hand and said, no, it's called Midori, it's green. Another kid raised his hand and he said, I know why that is called Osculatum. I didn't know, so I had to say, all right, please enlighten us. He said, well, you know, uh, if the Pope came in the room, put his hand up, kissed his ring, what that's called? It's not called kissing the ring. It's called osculating. It means to kiss. And so, you see why they call it osculata? You have red lips on there? Oh, yeah. right? And then saccate, like that other one, there's a big pocket here. So those big red lips there. And so those early taxonomists look at this, right, and they go, let's call this the kissing organ. Probably a lively bunch of facts on this. <laughs> Osculatum, the kissing catacetum. Then there's denticulatum. And denticulatum, in the next four pictures I'm going to show you, were recently discovered in Brazil. There's a guy named Francisco Miranda. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you had him here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Francisco's a good guy. And so Francisco, when he was a grad student in Brazil, him and his buddies, you know, you form little groups were uh, sitting around and they dawned on them that they can now drive to Amazonia because the foresting companies were cutting roads through the trees so they could get the trees out and assay, you know, the timber it, get a value on what they've got, figure out what resources they need to get in there and get the wood out. And so they hopped in their cars and drove to Amazonia instead of walking through Amazonia. Why not drive? What a novel idea, right? And so uh, they went in there and they discovered four catacetums. And this is one described by Francisco Miranda. He's a taxonomist that uh, it described this. He named it Denticulatum, which is the dentate or tooth catacetum. And if you look right here, you can see real clearly those teeth. It's a miniature growing plant, a whole full grown plant's about that big. It's really quite small but they've got a real showy stem about maybe 14 inches long with 20 to 25 flowers. Really a cool thing. The, uh, another one of his colleagues, a gentleman named Kleber, named and described this one. He named it after himself, Cleberianum. And uh, Cleberianum has this really attractive yellow flower and these tiger stripe kind of petals and sepals. And uh, I really believe this plant is promising. In fact, I have a hybrid there on the table with Cleberianum. I have three plants of Cleberianum. In Brazil, 
there's probably three plants of Cleveriana, and that's it in the world. And uh, because those same roads that gave access so they could find and describe these, gave access so they could cut the trees down and haul the lumber out. And so they're pretty sure all the Brazilians at Cleveriana is extinct in the wild. And there's just a few plants in cultivation. So I was fortunate about 15 years ago to get an importation uh, of these plants. And uh, so I'm really nervous because I might have roughly half the world's population in the greenhouse. And I killed them. I used to have four. I hate to say that. I used to have four. Now I have three. And so this is not, not something to feel good about. So, yeah. so they're very special plants. Then there's tigrina. And so Francisco and I, we were at the Lafayette short course that they have in, uh, in uh, Christmas time or in December. And so he was there and we were talking and, and I put this up. I love Tigrinum. It's such a great breeder. has beautiful flowers. It's small, big, long spike, lots of blooms on it. But I've always wondered why you would name it Tigrinum. And so I called on Francisco to explain because it was his group of colleagues that named this. And so my first question was, tigers. Where do they come from? And of course, tigers come from India. And do tigers have spots? Or do tigers have stripes? Tigers are striped. So Francisco, he knew immediately where I was going. And he said, yes, yes, yes. They're excellent taxonomists. They're terrible zoologists. <laughs> and he later then uh, continued to say Portuguese was the first language, so, and in Spanish too, any cat-like animal, you call it a tigre, a tiger, right? They're not tigers, but if we all had a cat that we called tiger. And so the tigrinum, or Tigres, the panthers, right, and the leopards, they call them tigres. It would have been better to call it lepardina or something like that. But tigrinum it is. Really a nice plant. And then the last of the four that they discovered, they called it soroides. And soroides normally looks like this. If this is a, a, just a freak of nature, I ended up with a plant that was an albino. About 50 flowers on this stem. It's only that long. It's a real tight bunch of blooms on there. Very unusual, very unique looking. So remember Peleotum, Expanthum, Tenebrosum, Spitzii, and Venaceum. Now we have flowers that look like this, completely different. So the one on the right was albino. Yeah, this is an albino. Yeah, that's normal on the other side. Then there's a whole group, the fimbriate, with the frilly lip type. Beautiful colors, wonderful frilly lips, and then, uh, spots. Now, fimbriatum comes in different color forms. There's also this moreniana form, the moreno, or the dark color form. There's barbatum, the bearded catacetum. How cool is that? There is gladiaturum. That look like a bay shrimp, anyone? <laughs> How about colosum? Beautiful, elegant looking flower. There's a sub variety that looks like this. Gorgeous. How about tabulari? We're old enough to yeah, we're all remember, we're old enough to remember the Rolling Stones, right? Yeah, right? They're our age. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the lips and the tongue? Yeah. There it is, right there, hanging out. You can see how tall it is off the lip. It's outrageous looking in person. And then what about this one, Lucius? So Lucius lives in the land between Venezuela and Colombia. That border area has been called no man's land for a long time. And so Lucius went undiscovered until the reign of terror of Hugo Chavez. And there was this little bit of 
telling tranquility that occurred between the two countries. And Lucius looks like this, full moon. So sitting on the ground at Carlos's feet, right, the top of the plant is above his knees, the leaves at his waistline, and the spike is his chin. So Carlos is the tallest guy you ever saw. That's about five feet tall. An unusual plant. It looks like a certipodium vegetatively, and that may have been why they weren't discovered earlier. And then there's sanguinium. See the monkey face in there? Yeah. Yeah. See it? The two eyes, the knob. So I took I took this picture, right? And so I'm uh, I'm in I'm in Montreal. Or no, I was in Toronto. Toronto has a big orchid society. They got 150 people who attend the meeting. And so it's this huge, you know, huge congregation. And I'm standing up on the stage on a podium, and people start laughing and murmuring and pointing and saying, monkey face. Well, they're pointing towards the stage, as though I'm on the stage. And so I'm getting a, I'm, and I'm a little, I'm getting a little, you know, self-consciousness of this, this you know monkey face kind of comments and obviously I'm not a good poker player because the guy right off to the side said not you the picture and it was way worse because now the heat is pouring out of the picture and I'm beet red <laughs> I never took this I did not I took this photo I you know oh remember my crocodile dundee moment you know what I was holding catacetum sanguinium those plants right there and so I never noticed that. Now, look, everybody sees the, the monkey yep, face. Yes. Every, yeah. No one's not seeing that. Unbelievable. Here's the two eyes, right? The nostrils, the lips, and the cheek. Yeah, I see it now. Unbelievable. True story. Then there's, so remember Peleotic expansive of tenant rose? Now we're looking at this thing, Rosio Mirans. How bizarre looking. That. Or what about this one? Globiflorum? Amazing. Look how horrific it looks. Look, nice fruit. Look at the mouth, right? And then the tonsils. <laughs> oh. And the green hemp. It doesn't need eyes. It's an alien. <laughs> so fascinating. This is only uh, 28 pictures of the different species. We've only seen male flowers. Catacete and I are sexually dimorphic. They have male and female flower forms. We've only seen males. Males are showy, large, uh, uh, very memorable flowers. They all have pollen injecting triggers. The female flowers cannot be used for species identification because all the flowers are green helmets. You cannot identify the species based on the female flowers across the 135 different species. They all look the same, green helmets. Both the male and female flowers produce the same fragrance. And so, remember Catacetum peleata, my first one, it's large and showy, it's highly fragrant, can be seen from long distances. See a female? Green helmet. Uh, are the plants male and female? Bell pepper. Or? Cards, bell pepper. Same. <laughs> the plants are both male and female. So it will put out one or the other? The plants will bloom female when they're large and robust. And large, robust plants are grown with plenty of light, plenty of nutrients, and it had a long time to grow. When a seed pod forms on a plant, it's tough to carry a seed pod to term. And so catacetums are going to experience two to three months of an extremely dry winter period. And so a large, robust plant has enough nutrients and, and stores to, to carry that seed pod to term. Plants that are grown shady or darker or immature plants, smaller plants, will most likely be male. And so there's Peleotum, male and female. Here's Lucius, 
male and female trimming spikes sticking up five feet in the air, 25 flowers on it. That's the male. Look at the female. Green helmet. Here is Tenebrosum, dark, shadowy, beautiful looking thing. Here's the female. Green helmet. You would think that, never mind, it could be the other way. Why would you think that? Uh, no, I, yeah, I know, but never mind. You get in trouble with this discussion. Yeah. Yeah, watch yourself. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> the, uh, and so, we could do this 130 more times. Green helmet, green helmet, green helmet, green, over and over and over again. So what's possibly is the purpose of this. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Right? It's to assure genetic diversity. If you can't pollinate yourself, you can't inbreed. And so if you can only cross with a, a outside of yourself, with a cousin or a relative or from a different population, the chance of producing offspring that are more capable of dealing with the changing environmental conditions is higher. I think this explains the, the widespread distribution of catecetum because they've been very adaptable to a wide range of growing conditions. So this, uh, so this isn't a very unusual, but I think this phenomenon, this male-female phenomenon, isn't a condition that has been around for millions of years. I think it's a recently evolved state. This is very beneficial for the plant to allow it to thrive in varying conditions. Other orchids aren't doing this, only catacetums. And so I think it's a recent state because sometimes you see plants like these. Remember my uh, Crocodile Dundee moment in Sanguinium? Here's the female, there's the male. This is a different one here. There's the male, there's the female. Always the green helmet. Cross well, these are the perfect flower forms. But what about this? So here we go. Is that a male flower? Absolutely. And is that a female flower? Absolutely. But what is that? Right? Obviously, evolution takes time. It just doesn't one day be like this and the next day be like that. There has to be changes that occur over many, many generations. And so this, I think, helps prove my point about catacetini are recently evolving because occasionally you get throwbacks to an earlier state, perfect flowers that have both male and female parts. And so if you look at this flower, you can see the female, the bland petal. You can see the, the, the helminty shaped lip on one half. There's a half an opening to the stigmatic surface. On the other side, you can see the trigger, the showy lip, and the colorful petals. You know, I touched the trigger, and it released the pollinium, and I inserted the pollinium right there. And it fertilized the flower. You ever hear that orchid seed is a microscopic, and you can't see with the naked eye? Well, that's generally true, but not always. In the genus Cymbidiani, the seed is rather coarse. Actually, if you put dry seed in your hand, there's kind of a granularity, sandiness. So that seed pod grew and germinated and it matured and I split it open and I, and I sowed a lot of seeds. So yeah, that's, that's, that, that, could, that is viable seed. But I kind of wish now, you know, this is like 25 years later, that if I would have sowed that seed, would some of the offspring favor this, this condition? And if it did, and I would have selected those plants and crossed them together again, and then done it again, you know, and again and again, how many times would it take to turn back the clock of time and make catacetums perfect blooms? That would be pretty cool. I'm out of time now. I have to charge. Young Carlos did that to me. <laughs> Fascinating, though, to think that because it, it would be forced, right? It wouldn't be random through nature. Now we'd be forcing it to happen. I bet you could do it. In Ten generations. So pollinization must be complicated. They got male and female flowers. This is ridiculous. Isn't this confusing for the pollinator? You don't even, how would you know where to go to 
And obviously it must know because you have to pollinate the flowers for the progeny to, to the, the, for the plants to succeed and produce progeny. So there's a bee called the euglossine bee. Euglossine bees are the pollinators. Euglossine bees collect the floral fragrances off the male and female flowers and they put these oils in pockets on their legs. And the theory is when they get the right mixture of these oils, they become very attractive to female euglossine bees. And a male euglossine bee has just a few things on his mind, right? He wants to eat and reproduce. And so getting those essential oils are critical to the passing his genes forward. Both the male and female catacetums are fragrant. And so that's a male euglossine bee. They're quite attractive. In fact, if this was a group of entomologists, everyone would be going, yeah, finally we're talking about a cool bug. <laughs> the bug? Yeah, the bee. They're, exactly they're stingless. They're just beautiful. People collect euglossine bees. They're fantastic. You might even have euglossine bees around here. Some of the metallic blue or, or green in the summertime when it's hot and humid. Sometimes fishermen, they'll get on, if you're filleting fish, the bees will come in and get on there. <laughs> there was a, a couple of years ago on our, our, our high school state exam, when we had the course exams in biology, there was a question about that. I just remembered it. But it had to do with the relationship between orchids and um, Orchid Brazil bees. nuts. Oh. And the male euglossia bees, bees get the scent on them from the orchids. And the females will, female bees will only mate with smelly male. Appropriately bees. smelly males. But right. it's only the female bees that pollinate the Brazil nut trees. Ah. So without the males getting the smell from the orchids, there right. will be no more babies, and then the Brazil nut trees would suffer and die. Yes, and, then, so and, if, and if the male Eulossian bee couldn't get the right orchid scent on it, it wouldn't mate with female bees, and the orchids would die. The symbiosis is outrageous. So the male bee has these. Uh, pockets on their legs. You can see it here. This is the pocket. And so they wipe these essential oils off the surface of the flower and put it in the pockets on their legs. This is where the reservoir is for that scent. And so you can see on the back of this euglossine bee, on the thorax, there's pollinia attached. So this euglossine bee has visited a male flower, touched the trigger, and released the pollinia. Then here's a female flower. Remember the female flower is helmet shaped. And so now the helmet shape is a reduced space. It forces the washing bee in just the right orientation. And you can see how he holds on to the lip. And, but, and he crawls up inside here, and there's just a little bit of essential oils. And the pollinia you can see is almost ready to insert into that stigmatic cavity. It's fascinating. So watch this video. you got to watch quick. The first second is real time, and then it slows down. Watch, watch quick. That's it. Now here's slow mo. Wow. And here's ultra slow mo. See the foot reaching up. Rep touches the trigger. Look at the pollinia. Whack. Pretty good, huh? So watch it again. Watch it in real time. Oops. Come on, start. super slow motion. You can see the wings beating and you can still hardly see the pollinia. The pollinia shoots out with such force. So imagine this, okay. The euglossium bee has got to go to the male flower first and then to the female. Otherwise it doesn't work. So the male flower evolves this highly showy appearance. Very colorful. It's covered. You can see these essential oils on the surface of the flower. You can wipe it off and smell it. So highly attractive. And the male euglossian bee has got only one thing on his mind, is getting those oils and so he can get on with his business. So the male catacetum flower advertises this. 
You lost him if he could harvest all the oils in one visit to a male catacetum flower. Might be good for the bee, but it's not so good for the catacetum reproduction. So what happens? The flower evolves a natural shoeing mechanism. What did you just say? Yeah, the pollen ejecting trigger. So the male gets on the flower and he's worried about collecting those oils so he can go get female euglossy bees, touches the trigger, and whack! You saw what happened. Knock them off the flower. There's a scientific term for whack. It's called negative reinforcement. <laughs> right? Ever been negatively reinforced? Okay, so that euglossy bee, whack! And you can see these aren't stupid. That flower goes whack. And so you fly away. It's an unpleasant experience. So that is not a good place to be. So you fly away and you see a non-threatening flower that smells the same. You approach this flower because you're not afraid of whack. You crawl up inside. The only one thing up inside that helmet is only a smallest amount of the same essential oils you need. And so you don't loiter, you're done. And on the way out, the polonia slips into the stigmatic cavity and you fly off. Now, of course, you glossy bees aren't known for their memory skills. <laughs> there may be some parallels with males, humans. <laughs> and they then, of course, return back to the male flower because he's only got one thing on his mind and he's now forgotten and he goes back and starts collecting the oils again, and then of course, whack, and it repeats itself over and over and over again. You should grow these just for this reason. <laughs> Think of the fun you can have wowing your friends with your knowledge of plant sex. Think of the fun over cocktails. Right? You could have a male catacetum plant and have the unsuspecting person reach in there and touch, you'll call it trigger, call it hair, touch that. And the pollen comes flying, scares the living daylights out of it. It comes jumping out across, it's stuck, it's big, it's stuck, you're going like this, you can't. And then, of course, the, all the hubble settles down and then you deliver the punchline. You've now been pollinated. <laughs> When's the last time you pollinated one of your friends over cocktails? <laughs> It's good. It's good stuff. All right, but enough of that talk. So hybridization. All right, because catacetums have so many different flower colors and forms, it's an excellent plant to breed with. You have a near infinite palette of species that you can work with to create some hybrids. Breeding can be difficult because you have to have male and female flowers present. You can. If you bloom everything female or everything male, you're out of luck. You gotta have both sexes. So it's compelling to save pollen for when the females appear and so forth. And if I forgot to mention, they make excellent hobby plants. And so here's catacetum orchiglate. So you take expansum and you cross it with peleotum, makes orchiglate. It's a primary hybrid, simple hybrid between two species. Orchiglades have been really good, and I still use orchiglade a lot in breeding. Where does the red come from? Uh, the expansum. Uh, well, it's expansum. Not red, right? Yeah, well, but, but every uh, child, right, is going to yeah. be different. Yeah. And so this is this individual plant. So you take orchiglade and cross it back to expansum, and it even doubles the red up even more and creates a hybrid called Susan Fuchs. Of course, you know Robert Fuchs. Susan is his sister. Yeah. So then there are things like Orchid Glade crossed with Tenebrosum. And that makes Donna wise. And the Donnas produce lots and lots of flowers. The Donnas have been very successful. Lots of AOS awards from the Donna wise. Really showy flowers. Then there's a hybrid Mark Demet. Mark Demet lives in Tucson, Arizona. Grows in a greenhouse, does a great job, and he made this cross. It's really quite nice. It's really broad. Donna and Mark. Yeah, really broad. I mean, Mark Dimmitt. It's a hybrid working blade and Donna Wise. 
So really broad petals, nice full heart-shaped lip with the contrasting eye. About 80% of the cross bloom just like this. 20% flowered like that. Complete albinos. Remember Peliotum, Catacetum Peliotum, the greenish flower? There's Peliotum on both sides of Donna Wise and on Orchidia. Then there's Crown Fox Voodoo with Susan Fuchs and Tenebrosum. And look at that. So a lot of these plants get awards and so forth. And so this one I named Sunset Valley Orchids. But a good cultivar name for crown, this Crown Fox Voodoo might have been Birds on a wire. Oh. And then Karen Armstrong. Karen lives uh, in, here in Texas. And uh, Denticulatum by Susan Fuchs. She flowered the first one, so I named it after her. And that's a Karen. A lot of my customers bloom plants before I do. This is named for a gal up in Cincinnati, Alexa Noel. She bloomed the first one, Denticulatum by Bella Vista Sangria. Beautiful thing. Then there was Denticulatum in Portuguese Star. Now, I don't want to hear anybody complaining about how hard it is to grow orchids around here. Chuck grows his orchids in Edmonton, Canada. It's minus 40 degrees there, a lot. And this is so I sold Chuck these plants in the spring. He flowered it, got it awarded before I even bloomed one. And this is his plant. Wow. Well deserved. So he named it after him. Then there's Dentigrianum denticulatum and tigrinum. And that came out good. I think that's particularly beautiful myself. Really a good looking flower. Then there's hybrids like Milana Davidson, Denticulatum and Penang. Milana's down in Miami. Grows these really well. That's a good one. And here's another nice one. Then there's Bell Taramanto, Chuck Taylor by Bella Vista Sangria. This is grown by a guy named Bernie Butts. Bernie lives in Toronto, Canada. He grows his catasthenias exclusively indoors under lights, under fluorescent lights never go outside, and that's the plant he flowered. Isn't that beautiful? Just an amazing thing. And then this one here. So this is called Sher So I think you notice these are all named for people. This is yeah. because my customers do a better job growing them than I do. <laughs> and so this guy, Frank Drew, lives in Virginia. Uh, lives in Virginia Beach, Virginia, actually. And he's the old retired sheriff. Virginia Beach. He was the sheriff for over 20 years, and no one ever ran against him for the job. He was that beloved or something. Or maybe it was his name. If your name is Frank Drew, how could you run against that name? <laughs> I mean, it's such a beautiful name. And so he flowered the first one. He calls me up and says, Fred, look at this. It's a great thing. On it. Let's call it Frank Drew. It had just sounds, you know, Frank Drew. It just sounds so good. And he told me, no, 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 I want you to call it Sheriff Frank Drew. <laughs> Fine. So we named it Sheriff Frank Drew. I was in Virginia Beach last year, and I had some of these available. And everybody in the club wanted a piece of the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a close-up. And then this one. So this is a true story. I speak Spanish quite well, as some of you noticed. So I was going to uh, Puerto Rico to give a talk. First time I'm giving a talk in Spanish. Uh, and I hadn't really given a talk in Spanish before. I'm pretty confident I can do it, but you know, you've never done it, so you don't know. Plus, I speak Spanish. They speak Caribbean Spanish, which is different. And so uh, I got this pre order common thing from Fong Singh. So I'm pretty sure, because it's a thousand dollar pre order, that it's an old Chinese guy. I don't know, you know how you read an email and you know, it's like, uh, thousand dollar order sounds like a smart must be an old Chinese guy so and I'm a little nervous because to take a thousand dollar order somewhere and not pay for it is the problem so I get to Puerto Rico and I sold all the plants that I had sold out sold there and I gave the talk it was so funny because I kept saying injerto instead of cruzamiento oh. and they were laughing so hard 
and, that, and they would tell me, no, cruzamiento, and then I would just say, inherito, and so they were just busting up. It was so fun. Sold all the plants, standing there, and there's the box for Fong Sing, the old Chinese guy. And you can't bring plants home from Puerto Rico because there's phytosanitary restrictions and all these stuff. And so now I'm, what am, everyone's left. What am I going to do with these plants? I'm going to have to throw them out. I'm getting in a dark place, right? Not a happy day. And next thing you know, parachutes and show up in front of me in this voice. And I'm in a dark place, mind you, right? I'm going to throw this stuff out. And the next thing this voice says, hi, I'm Fong Sing. And I look up and I said, oh my God, you're so beautiful. This is not normal form of English for me. In fact, I'm not sure I ever spoke to my wife with such sincerity, right? I mean, it just came out. And so Fong is beet red, I'm beet red, she's 35 years old, Chinese Puerto Rican woman. <laughs> Caught me off guard completely. And so, of course, it's very embarrassing, you know, so we get over it. She buys the plants and uh, bloom the first one. There you go, Fong Sing. So I named this one Fong Sing Broken Hearted. Then this one flower, and this is Fong Sing Lonely Hearted. <laughs> what do you do? Right? And then my mother's namesake. So Donna Wise and Susan Fuchs makes Louise Clark. Can you say anything about Jose? Jose Abalo, that's just the name of the parent. Remember Monkey Face? Yeah, that was You see it? Yeah. Well, it's a hybrid with Monkey Face. Oh. Jose is, yeah. You can see it, though, can't you? Yeah. It's good eyes. And when you look at Fong Sing, look. You don't want to call her Monkey Face, but you can see the tendency. It's upside down, though, right? See, this is down, yeah. and now this is turned up. Oh. And so the Fongs right at the flower orientation finally, after two generations. And really a big, those are big flowers, you guys, like this. And the big, tall stems, really impressive, the fong seeds. Just breathtaking. And so then Louise Clark. So Louise Clark's Donna Wise by Susan Fuchs. Those have been really nice. Lots of awards and stuff to those. All right. How do you grow? seen a little bit about how they look in nature. So they live where there's monsoonal summer. They want lots of water, lots of fertilizer, lots of light and air movement in the summer. To grow good plants, you need to supply that. Can you keep them in water? I don't know. They live on the sides of trees. They live on sides of trees. How well drained is the side of a tree? It's not standing in water. So, But you can water a lot. Around here, you can probably water every other day and they would be fine. You want to fertilize a lot too. Remember where they were living on those trees? There's a lot of nutrients up there. You want to use a half a teaspoon of fertilizer in your water every time you in a gallon of water every time. You need to use the open well drained media because you're going to be watering a lot and you want to water a lot. You repot and divide just as the new growth is starting to put out, or the old suitable is starting to put out new growth. The roots follow the new growth. And you don't begin to water in earnest, as, or you don't begin to water at all, until the roots are three to eight inches long. Usually the top growth is about eight inches to 10 inches tall. Very important to wait. And uh, I'll tell you why, but then I'll show you why a bit in just a minute. Catacete and I grow their roots in anticipation of rainfall. They grow their roots out, then the rains come. This is a, a very important distinction. In fact, I'm going to repeat that don't begin watering until they're three days, and probably five or six more times here in the next 10 slides. And it's that important. And so the environmental conditions they uh, like are just like yours 85 to 95, with not much colder than 60 in the summer. But if it's 80 degree at night, they don't care. In fact, they like that. If you could, I'd love to have my greenhouse be 80 degrees at night. There's only one problem. In California, it's 65 degrees at night, and I'm not willing to heat 
my greenhouse at night in the summer to make it 80 degrees. But if I could afford it, I would do it. The winter temperatures, they really don't like temperatures below 50. 45 would be the rock bottom minimum, but 50 is as far as I usually go. They like light levels like Vanda light right around three to 4,000, but I've also seen beautifully grown plants under lower light conditions. But basically it's Cattleya to Vanda light. Cattleya to Vanda brightness, they really do well. Well, remember the one on the tree? How much light is that? Right? I mean, on the telephone pole. I mean, that's getting light like crazy, and it was doing fine. And then they like humidity. 80% humidity or better is fine. Telling you, you guys have perfect conditions here to grow these plants in the summer. And that's when they grow in the summer because the winter, they're dormant and they're resting. And so the growth cycle in nature, it's hot, wet, and humid in the summer. And in the winter, it's dry and cool. They require these changes. They've evolved for thousands of millions of years, actually, under these conditions. Watering begins when the roots are three to eight inches long. Watering too early can cause bulb rot. Most of the roots die in the prior year. Cataseed and I replace their entire root system annually. Now, but roots have several purposes, right? They pick up nutrients in water, but they're also a hold fast. They anchor the plant. So even though the root's dead, it's still a hold fast still holds the plant down. They're just not picking up nutrients. So the new roots, the roots that are growing three to eight inches long, that you're going to wait to water, are the roots that are going to do all the work and grow the new growth. If you disturb or damage those roots, then the plant won't grow as well as it could if you did. So this is a real, real important detail. So here's the plant. So what is a suitable to a plant? water tank. It's very good. That's exactly what it is. In fact, if you took a pseudo hole filled with water and you put it in a special oven and you dried it down to its remains and you re removed all the water, what's the second most common element? Carbon. And the sugars and the nutrients, the potassium, the calcium, and it was negligible in that residue. It's almost all carbon. It's 90% carbon. So if your plant is just water and carbon, really, with a little bit of other stuff, this plant, water tank, looks full. If your tank is full, can you put more in it? So this plant is communicating with you in plant speak. And it's saying, hey, look, my tank is full. You yeah, haven't watered this plant in a couple months because you heard my talk, but now you have a green growth growing. And you haven't wanted, you want to want. Remember, we mentioned that catastina plants and orchids don't have a nervous system. This plant is not feeling bad because you didn't water. That's a personal problem you have. <laughs> and so, do not water this plant. You ever heard of Murphy's Law? Right? It's not Murphy's theory, right? It's Murphy's Law. And so, because Murphy's Law is true, it's a law, if you were to water this plant, you'd probably get water in the middle of that new growth. And you would probably have a fungal spore fall in that little pool of water. And since it's Murphy's Law, that would be the day the cold front, humid, damp, cold front moves in, and then that little pool of water in the middle of that new growth would stay wet for more than 12 hours, and that fungal spore would germinate and rot the new growth out. That's why it's called Murphy's Law. So don't water. No need to water. The plant is telling you, don't water me anyway. A few weeks later, the bulb is still firm and plump, the new growth is elongated considerably. But now you have green root tips emerging from the base of the plant. This is a very hard time. This is when you get ready to water. You buy a new hose. You mix up fertilizer. 
you move the plant closer to water, but no water because the roots are not three to eight inches long. You gotta wait. This is the hardest time. Because you're dying to water, but your plant doesn't have a nervous system. It doesn't feel bad. Only you do. Do not water. Fight the temptation. Then the plant has got roots that have drilled down into the potting media. They might be coming out the drainage holes, jumping over the side. They're now three to eight inches long. And the new growth is about eight inches long as well. The roots have now grown out in anticipation of rain. And now's the time to water and fertilize. When you start to water and fertilize, the plant enters into this rapid growth stage. And all of a sudden, that new growth elongates, and all of a sudden, the flower spikes appear on certain early uh, bloomers. They flower, and they look fantastic. Bring it to the meeting, show off your plants. Everyone's all jealous because they didn't <laughs> buy one when Fred was visiting. <laughs> then all of a sudden, Thanksgiving rolls around, and your plant is starting to look like heck. The leaves are turning yellow. It's communicating with you again and saying, hey, look, I'm losing my photosynthetic surface. That's why the leaves are turning brown. If you don't have chlorophyll and you can't photosynthesize, what's the purpose of water? So this is the plant's way of telling you, back off on the watering. It's so the, the plant enters its dormancy because some things change in nature, right? The seasonal changes in nature. So the monsoons are raining and it's pouring rain during the long days. The rain starts to slow down. The days get shorter. It's cooler. The plants sense these changes in day length and the lack of rainfall and the cooler weather are the triggers that kick the plant in to start losing its chlorophyll. The plant needs to prepare itself for its winter rest. There's gonna be two to three months without any moisture uh, uh, arriving to the plant. So it needs to harden off to be ready. So it's saying to you right now, I'm getting ready to harden off, tone me up. And you tone it up by backing off on the watering frequency. So it gets harder and harder and harder to suitable so it's ready for for winter. So you stop fertilizing and reduce your irrigation frequency, increasing the dry interval between water. Then Christmas rolls around. All the leaves would be brown. Hopefully you have one, two, three, four, five, six flower spikes on the plant from the previous year, and then you stop watering. And the plant rests. And so here you go. Remember my uh, crocodile Dundee moment? my catecetum sanguinum and monkey face, there it is growing on the ground. So it's growing on the ground. They were also growing on some rocks and on some small trees. The plants on the ground were the biggest plants. There's a lot more nutrients on the ground. They live in a semi-deciduous forest. So every year, that leaf litter is falling on the ground and decaying, falling on the ground and decaying, creating a very rich root environment. The ones on the rock had just a little bit of organic litter on them, and the ones on the trees had none, and they were just only about that big. The ones on the ground were big, like this. Nutrient access. So how old is this plant? All right, you can count it up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years, at least. Only the oldest portion here looks a little bit dehydrated. So this plant has dealt with many seasons of wet and dry and is doing okay. Not overly uh, suffering from that. So you pull the plant out of the ground, there's a new growth here that's buried in the leaves, you can't even see it, and you can see the white roots that are growing in anticipation of rainfall, and you can see the old dead roots from the prior year. You flip the plant over, and you can see that those white roots are growing all around the perimeter of the plant. They're reaching out into that rich organic substrate. They're not growing down like a taproot, they're growing out into that organic litter. So imagine this, our guide told us the rains weren't going to start for another month. So this plant has grown this whole new root system laying in wait in this dry bed of organic leaf litter. As soon as the rains come, this large root system is laying in wait. New, the water hits the, the 
the, the solids, they convert it to solution, and the roots are there, they capitalize on that, and then the plant goes and flowers. This is why you wait to water until your roots are three to eight inches long, because you simulate this phenomenon that you see in nature. Here's my greenhouse right about now, the corner of the breeding stock. It's all luxurious, green, and beautiful. Here's a picture. Six months from now, in January, <laughs> all the leaves have, now you see there's still some green leaves. I haven't watered these plants in a month. Just because you haven't watered doesn't mean they won't bloom. You see the flowers here, and here, and there, 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 and there all the way down. The plants can bloom while they're dormant. And if a plant chooses to bloom while it's dormant, that means it feels it can bloom while it's dormant, and since it's dormant, it's not getting any rain, no need to water. In fact, some plants only bloom during dormancy. You can pollinate those plants during dormancy, and they go ahead and set pods and produce viable seed. Okay, so for the ninth time, <laughs> wait to irrigate until the roots are three to eight inches long. This is probably, if you've grown them before and you've had problems, this is, besides freezing, it's probably the reason why they didn't do so good for it. You start watering too early. It's very common to start watering too early. You gotta get over that. You wanna use a well-drained potting media because you're gonna water a lot. You wanna fertilize with a half a teaspoon every time you water. Your plants will appreciate that. You reduce irrigation when the leaves start to yellow, stop fertilizing, if you stop watering with a bulger leafless or generally right around New Year's. If you still have a few leaves, your New Year's resolution will be, I'm not watering my catasthenums until the roots are three to eight inches long again. You're talking about zero water. Oh. Big fat zero. So if it rains, then they're sitting outside? Well, you should move them under the heat. Yeah, so move them under yeah. so they don't get Yeah, so they're not getting water. So you know, if they got a little water, I'm just not going to kill them. But you don't want to actively be watering them. They won't like it. The, uh, in, my, uh, in my nursery, I have over an, an acre of, of greenhouse, and uh, it takes me eight hours to water. I water by hand the whole place because I believe watering is the most important thing. And so because of that, come January 1st, I'm a happy camper because it takes two hours to water my catasetums. So my work day goes from an eight hour water day to a six hour water day. Can you and take them out of the sun and be in dark place like sunshade? No. In nature, no one moves them. They don't need that much light when they're dormant. So if you have them in a good growing area outside, you know, or under a shade structure or something, and you might get some rains in the winter, you do want to move them so they're not getting water while they're in their dormant rest. It's going to be humid enough around here. Your humidity doesn't get that low in the winter, right? Mm -hmm. and you're going to be fine. Some people, like you know, who live in Minnesota or Edmonton, you know, they've got the heat on, and they, you know, it's 40 or 30, you know, and they got the heat on. The air is so dry. You ever go visit relatives, you know, and you're like, your nose feels like it's going to crack and fall off your face. And so that's really low humidity. And so catasetums, people who grow them in that, in those conditions need to do something to have for extra humidity so it can survive better. But around here, I think you're going to be just fine. Repot and divide just as a new growth starts. This is important. You don't want to disturb roots that have already grown. You only just, because the, the roots are only going to grow once a year. So if you disturb them halfway grown, it's going to interfere with their ability to function. So you only repot the, the root, the new growth is small. <laughs> Do I need to say it? <laughs> and thank you guys very much. Thanks to these guys and all of you. These guys are running great. Thanks. All right. So Any questions? When you repot, when you repot, would you take the ten these ones and you remove all the Benjamin boys from media? Okay. What I would do with these three pods is I would just add more moss around the existing pod and 
and shift it up. You guys, a lot of you guys go on clay pot, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So get a clay pot and shift it up. Now, one of the things about moss, have you ever bought those phalaenopsis in the store? Mm -hmm. and, and there's like what, 15 pounds of wet moss. Yeah. All right. And you go, my gosh, and then they don't do that good. Yeah. And the first thing you want to do is get them out of moss. So when you're in the hobbyist when you're going to moss, you don't want your moss to be ever any deeper than about two and a half or three inches. By put, filling the pot up all the way with moss, it's going to stay way too wet too long. So by limiting it to just a couple inches, it's really beneficial. And you ever notice how clay pots have more of a taper on them than plastic pots <coughs> really straight sided? Clay pots have a taper, that's so they can release from the mold. And so that taper is your friend. And when you get the moss and you have a plant, wrap all that moss around, get a big ball, and shove it in the clay pot, but try to leave an inch or two of air space below the moss ball. Mm. And so now you have air underneath, and air on the top, and it'll dry out really fast the moss, so you get all the benefit of the moss, even phalaenopsis or whatever you're trying, leave that air space underneath. So then you get a lot of air on the roots, it dries out fast, and you don't get that, that saturated wet problem like you do if you, in, you can easily test it, just shove some moss to the bottom of the pot, and now there's no way for it to drain. By getting those two surfaces really improves the drain, and it'll really help a lot. No peanuts? You could put peanuts, but in the clay pot, there's so much paper, you'll find that you're going to go, aha, when you stick it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And try to get a big enough moss ball so when you shove it in, it's the right amount of moss. The first time, you know, if you have to add more moss, then it's easy to cram it down to the bottom. So get a big wad and shove it in and let it bridge the bottom. Do you not put bar or anything like that? No, no. And it takes a little bit of it takes a little bit of practice, but once you get it, you're, you're gonna be like, oh yeah. And then you use less moss, the same moss is in there. So if you use half as much moss, then you're you're doing good. Yeah. And you don't ever grow them in your barn. I grow some in the barn. But I find that moss gives better growth. Sometimes if I have a really large plant with like five or ten bulbs, I'll put it in bars. But usually I don't want it to come back to baby because then it's a nightmare. Then you have to keep all those plants. Then they're harder to grow. But I'm a plant breeder. And you as a hobbyist, please grow humongous plants. But for me, you do. Right now, leave it just like this. Yeah, and then next spring, when that new growth starts popping up, that's when you add moss around. Uh, right now, you're fine. <laughs> keep watering. Well, you got more than eight inches of growth, and it's well rooted. So this plant is well into its rooting cycle. See all the roots and everything. Yeah, you want to water and fertilize the thing. You're going to be watering every other day around here right now. Oh, yeah. Even if it's outside. Even if it's outside. Inside, you still have to water every other day. It depends on much AC you don't want to have to be up. Right? Because that can dry out too. Okay. All right. Let's go online. So if, if you're growing outside in the rain, Slow release fertilizer is good because it's hard to water after a rain. And so, if you're growing your beds, get them in the rain. But the beds don't grow on water because so every time it rains, they fertilize. I'll take your order. It's not raining, it's water. I can't get up this year fertilizer. For the holidays, water. Yeah. So, it's a good way because they want a little fertilizer all the time. Well, no, but you're going to do this. So, grow mark pieces, grow fertilizer. Because you're going to take off and store it in the rain. Yeah. If you're going in a greenhouse, you don't need throwing grow because you're going to put fertilizer in your water every time you want. Oh. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Are you trying to grow? Oh, yeah. Oh, I have tried to grow this. They're hard to grow. Yeah, I've said very sterilata. I've had some, and I can grow them for a while. I'm not as far as 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 I'
No, I have one from the last time that we bought them. I remember it had the black flowers. I had it in a show and tell over here when we're in the little room. Every year it blooms. And it's like this right now. It's, it's ready. It's got the spike. It's ready to bloom. Wow. And I have it in potted. And I've had it maybe three or four years. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. It was in meow. <laughs> And it's at the store. So, air conditioners off on Sunday and Monday. There's no ventilation. Yeah. <laughs> And then let me get what I wanted free. Did you buy it? Yeah, I bought you. No, I just leave that in there. You don't want to disturb it anymore. It's been disturbed enough last year already, or this spring. And so just let it grow in there. Follow the watering instructions that we just went through. And then let it go dormant. And next spring, leave it in that pot. And when the new grows big enough, and that's how you'll get the biggest plant possible. Well, you want to water it when the media starts to dry out. So it would be every couple days. Thank you. Have you ever seen a micro epiratic infection?